Thank you. Happy holidays to those who are celebrating, and it looks like fall is actually here for everyone. Um, I could say something about the Cardinals, but I'm a Chicagoan, so. <laughs> but not a folks because <laughs> I grew up on the south side, so it's the way it's like. It all depends on what you're not caring much about any of the baseball. Anyway, um, Tom Bronson, uh, welcome. And I know on behalf of all of us, I want to convey our, our sympathy for the loss of your mother. And you were in, you were in our thoughts and prayers. And if you read your email today or have read the newspaper earlier, you know that one of our docents, Jerry Kaskowitz, passed away earlier this week. The funeral is tomorrow, visitation at 12.30, and the funeral at 1. And you do have an email about that. Uh, there'll be no docent meeting in November. Instead, I want everyone to attend the Kristallnacht program that evening, co-sponsored by the Jewish Book Festival. That would be on Thursday, November 14th. It would have been the second Thursday, the day of our meeting. At 7 o'clock, Jack Fairweather will be speaking about his book, The Volunteer. Um, I think Julie brought uh, schedules for the entire festival, because there are several Holocaust-related a text this year, and you let them. Uh, where all the brochures are by in the front, the desk, yes. so they're by the security desk in the front. Uh, did Glory step out? No, I didn't. Oh, you had some announcements. Yes. All right. I know some people were interested in the Scott Miller program. Uh, so I posted the video on YouTube. It cut out about 10 minutes before the end of the lecture, but it was an excellent lecture and the video still has the gist of the program. Uh, so you can find our YouTube video and channel. If you go to our website and then you scroll all the way to the bottom and you click on the YouTube logo, it'll take you to our YouTube channel. You can find it there. Uh, I put a note on the new calendar. Sign up for as many round robin tours as you'd like because we have quite a few. Uh, but as there are fewer regular tours, start with just signing up for one regular tour. And then after a week or so, we can open it up to sign up for more. Uh, you can still sign up. There's some more tours in October that are open. So you can sign up for as many of those as you'd like. And you know, tours will be coming in throughout November. So. Want, you know, keep checking that because um, there will be more openings. Uh, remember to get student volunteers to complete the survey. Uh, this should be done after the speaker because we want their reflections to be both about the tour and the speaker. Um, so you know, tell the teacher to select volunteers, and you know, with 10 minutes left in the speaker, they should sneak out and go complete the survey. Uh, on round robin tours, uh, the reflection bags. Remember to please only put clean cards into the bag so it's ready to go for next time. The facilitator should collect the completed cards. Please don't put completed cards in the bag because then for the next time we use them, it's, there's you know used cards in there. Um, and I'm going to send an email hopefully today uh, asking for volunteers to stuff envelopes for our annual mailing. Uh, it's going to be next week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We're going to need volunteers to fold the letters and stuff envelopes and all that. Uh, and then there's going to be a separate sign up uh, to write notes. So I'll send a list of everyone who we're soliciting. And if you know someone, we're asking you to volunteer to come in and write a note, you know, something like, to your so-and-so, you know how great our work is, you know, it's special to me to be Joseph. thanks for support like yours. I give to your cause, you must. Yes. Lori, for those of us that are going to be on the trip with you, when will those be available? I want to do it. I want to do it. Right. So the plans we made, we said right now is October 23rd to 31st, but I realized that you're going to be gone. The pre-trip leaves before that. Um, I'm leaving before the pre-trip. What about next Friday? 
Will next Friday work for those going on the Israel trip? Okay. So then hope, I guess we'll try to stuff next Wednesday, Thursday, so they're ready to go Friday for the people going to Israel. Because then we're also we're closed this Monday, Tuesday, and next the following Monday, Tuesday. Yes. So if, if, if your the tour is for the say holidays or adults, you still want to do the survey? I'd say adults, no. College age, what do you think? Yes, yes for college age. <laughs> Good question. Anything else? All right, thank you. So um, there were a lot of comments about last month's enrichment program, which I appreciated hearing. Um, and I don't want to open up the conversation now, although I'm happy to speak with anyone that has something they want to say. Um, I thought uh, Anika Volta gave a very academic, clear, precise, by the definition, by the sort of parsing the definition of looking very objectively at, at um, the whole conversation. And I don't know that we've heard the last of that conversation, but uh, actually it was Warren Rosenblum who sent me this quote, which I thought was an interesting addition. It's a quote by, it's a quote by Victor Klemperer, who was a survivor, brother of Vern? No. Yeah. Yeah, Bernard is the son, brother. So his brother wrote his memoir and is frankly the better known of the brothers. And then there's a son who was in Hogan's Heroes um, with the same name. But Victor Klumper said, and he said it not in lately, but soon after the Holocaust, <clears throat> Victor Klumper said, so this is the voice of the survivor. In the future, I believe, when the word concentration camp is used, one will think of Hitler's Germany and only Hitler's Germany. So, a survivor's point of view. So, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, James Redfield, who is assist Assistant Professor of Biblical and Talmudic Literatures at St. Louis University. Uh, his primary research area is late ancient Judaism. He also teaches the Hebrew Bible with a special interest in this canon's afterlives in literature, criticism, and theory. Dr. Redfield approaches these sources primarily through culture, cultural anthropology, the field where he began graduate work, and his book project on curiosity and culture in early rabbinic law writes Talmudic law into the history of ethnography and cultural theory, both late, ancient, and modern. Is published in the above areas of the humanities and others. He is also an experienced translator of scholarship and literature in French, German, and Yiddish. Today we'll be focusing on his translation from the Yiddish in his presentation Beyond Fiddler on the Roof, Berdachevsky in Jewish Ukraine, Kirka, 1900. Thank you. with me about this project. This is a uh, culmination, almost, almost, culmination of a book project that I've been working on for some three years. Um, first as a fellow at the Yiddish Book Center, which offers a fellowship in translation. Um, definitely recommend that you apply for that and have another cycle coming up for first-timers as well as experienced translators. Um, and that translation project, which was this book, uh, Berdyshevsky's Yiddish Writings, 
is now entering its last stage of revisions, and I will be adding an introduction to that. Um, so this conversation is also a great opportunity to hear from you about the possible relevance of this volume, the sort of work that you do, and expertise that you have, and the introduction will be greatly enriched by, by the conversation. So I, I hope that we can um, pick each other's brains as it were. Although, of course, I'll be talking about a historical period and contexts which are much earlier than a lot of you are probably most involved in, I hope that what we can do in this conversation is to trace some deep continuities, both historical and, for lack of a better word, spiritual, in the experience of the Jews of Ukraine in this, uh, in this period, which, of course, is continuous in some sense with the Shoah. So what I'd like to do, uh, first of all, is give you some biographical background on the author, Mikhail Gazetovichesky. Uh, I like to sometimes refer to him as the greatest Jewish writer you've never heard of. <laughs> Perhaps some of you have. He was certainly a household name in Eastern Europe and Germany at the turn of the century, and in Israel still has an important scholarly and to some degree public following. There he is. Uh, in the flesh, he uh, was born in 1865 um, in, and died in 1921, fairly young. Uh, shortly after a pogrom in his hometown, which killed his entire family. And uh, um, after moving to Israel, so, uh, his, his, family, his family ended up in Israel, the, the, the others. Um, so, so how can I give a biography in a few short moments of Tereshevsky before we dive into the text that will be the focus of our conversation? I kind of want to uh, introduce him by way of comparison to an unexpected dialogue partner, the artist formerly known as Prince. Um, I'm not sure if you saw this New Yorker article that just came out about Prince's autobiography that he was working on towards the end of his life. Um, but Prince himself described this text as a, quote, handbook for the brilliant community wrapped in autobiography, wrapped in biography. And in much the same way, uh, Berdachevsky seems to have conceived of his life's work in multiple genres and languages as a sort of handbook for the modern Jewish community, wrapped in autobiography in obsessively rewriting his life story in all of these languages and modes, uh, and recasting the same tiny stock of motifs and experiences in endlessly new configurations, he was trying to tell a much larger story about the past and the future of Jewish life. And in particular, uh, his vision of Zionism represents a very different sort of Zionism from the ones that eventually became dominant in the modern period. And had a deep influence on figures like Ben Gurion, who wrote in a letter to his son that even as he, uh, in a certain sense, rejected everything that Berdachevsky said, he never stopped reading him um, and never stopped being inspired by him. Um, so, uh, this, this vision of Jewish life in modernity and of Zionism was one which focused on integrating all of the layers and corners of Jewish history while at the same time retaining their heterogeneity and their diversity. Um, it was one that was not particularly focused on territorial uh, nationalism and the acquisition of territory, but also not on um, what he viewed as uh, overly narrow European spiritual uh, values. It was a much more sort of folkloric, uh, folksy, diasporic uh, vision of Zionism. The Zionism of the shtetl, no less than of Neset. So uh, as I sort of represent his uh, biography and autobiography to you here, focusing on the work, it's important to bear in mind that nothing in this is ever merely personal. Um, but that uh, the writer sees himself as the vehicle and the reflection of a community. 
And in a sense, his stories have an agenda with respect to the inner life of that community. And he sees himself as having a role in shaping and trying to determine what its direction is. So the story of Bereshevsky is also the story of a, of a community in transition between the 19th century imperial political order and the 20th century national political order, in which Jews were trying to reassess and redefine who they were in order to assert their proper position on the margins of both of those dominant political systems. And as we'll see, this process was not without its crises and its traumas, which span multiple scales, both the large-scale national experience and the very intimate and domestic experience. So his stories reflect, or try to reflect, I think, that shift in scales as well between these two dimensions, which he saw as ultimately unified in one story of the Jewish spirit in this period. So, uh, Bernicheski was born in a town, which I can never pronounce, in the edition of Semitic Lodge. Semitic Medish. Is anyone know Polish here? Now, so I hear in Polish it's pronounced rather differently, but the Yiddish is translated as uh, And uh, this, this is famous, of course, as the cradle of Hasidism, because it is the, the place where the Val in the 1730s took up his, uh, his important role. Um, uh, now, um, this is the interior of the Bet Midrash, the drawing of the Bet Midrash. Uh, where he was sort of maintained by the community as a kind of uh, in-house shaman and healer figure. You have a tax register from this period, one of the few documents about the Besht in Polish, in which we see that he pays no tax. He's the only member of the Jewish community who has a blank next to his name. So he was already a very central figure. He did not, as the Shekhe Besht, the uh, biography of the Besht presents it, come from the outside, but rather was in fact a very central figure uh, in uh, in this uh, community from the beginning. And new work on the uh, social geography of Hasidism. Yes? Sorry to interrupt, but you should say that the Besh stands for and is the name of. The, the, the Al Shem Tov, the, the, the legendary founder of Hasidism. Oh, can I yes. also make a, a suggestion? Yes, please. Many of our docents are not Jewish. Uh -huh. So, for example, explain what a Besh <coughs> is. You may want to explain in a line or two what Hasidism is. Great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. You know, and I should have said this, it's now redundant, of course, at the beginning of my talk, but it would be sort of hypocritical to give a lecture about Yiddish literature and not welcome interruptions and um, yeah. throughout. Yeah, yeah, I do. So thank you. Thank you both very much for that. Yes. So the Ben Midrash is the study house, right, where the, where, where the, um, where the best, you know, uh, taught and people assembled. And these are both, you know, re reconstructions. Um, of the, of the interior there, and um, these are just a few books that I would recommend. These are all very recent books, okay, on the history of this movement, of the Hasidic movement, okay, which was a movement which emphasized very strongly uh, kind of devotion, uh, uh, emotional kind of piety, strong adherence to an individual leader, or tzaddik, the righteous man, um, who clustered people around him, often in a court setting, where people would present petitions, and he would dispense um, kind of charisma to them. And his influence then radiated outward from the court. Okay, and so this, this historical atlas of Hasidism, which is my breakfast reading these days, just an amazing, amazing book. Really cannot recommend it highly enough. Gives you in visual as well as narrative form a great sense of how in the 18th century, um, uh, from, from the Baal this movement developed in Eastern Europe around these kinds of centers. Okay, and what the boundaries of those uh, regions uh, was. This other book, A Hasidism New History, a large multi author project, uh, will, will give you more texture on, uh, on various regions and problems associated with it. And this other book, by the same person who wrote the historical atlas, which is uh, uh, fundamental rethinking of uh, Hasidism, how we think about the history of this, which is really important for Berdachevsky, as we'll see shortly, but also important for the whole spiritual horizon, right? that the Jews of Eastern Europe carried with them into the Shabbat, right? The, the, the whole fabric of kind of life in a lot of these regions was driven by the Hasidic uh, movement, by its values, by its adherence to this leader, by its mystical tendencies, its strong emotional tendencies, right? Um, so that, that's why I presented it uh, here. 
so, um, so Berchewski was born in this town, okay, in, this, in the town that was the epicenter of early uh, Hasidism, and that's not uh, that's not trivial. Um, on the other hand, he he moved, okay, so it would take about two days to walk from uh, to his new uh, his new hometown, just on the outskirts of Uman, okay, and so this is more in uh, sort of south central Ukraine. He actually grew up in a small shtetl or town called Dubova, where his father was the rabbi, the realm of the, of the town. And he was the firstborn son of the town rabbi. Okay? So he had kind of a certain social position there. Um, and uh, and he, he had a pretty traditional uh, early life. Okay? He was educated by his father. He then was engaged in his teens. Um, this is the this is the Kloist, the, the prayer house or synagogue of the um, Breslau Rechassidim, those who follow the Rabbi Nachman of Breslau in Milan, near near the Boba. Okay. Uh, and when he after he was married as a teenager, he moved to Teplik. Okay, Teplik um, may be familiar to you because it was the site of some major pogroms and then later um, in the Shoah of a major action against the community. Um, it, it was a mid-sized town with a majority Jewish population, a 52% Jewish population in this period, and he, he was, a match was arranged for him, and um, it did not work out. Okay. So the um, failure of his first marriage in his teens was one of the first uh, traumas and stories that he wove into an autobiography and would tell and retell obsessively throughout his literary career. And the significance of this first break would also become for him symbolic of a certain kind of struggle with tradition that really informed his whole narrative about what it was to be a modern Jew. Um, his, his divorce occurred not at his own uh, instigation directly, but on the behest of his father-in-law, who discovered that he had been reading secular literature. <laughs> so he was actually forced to dissolve the marriage as a consequence of reading of his reading habits. At this point, he did what a lot of men in his situation did, which was not to just leave the community, but rather to enroll in a different institution, in the Volodya Yeshiva, okay, which is, was a tremendously important um, institution in this period because it um, had both the pedigree of the Lithuanian Yeshiva tradition, had been founded by that tradition, but also was kind of an impressive institution of higher learning and brought together some of the great minds in traditional Judaism, many of whom actually, like Kuchowski, <coughs> had broader sort of secular leanings and were interested in learning other things. And so he actually was pretty well suited to this uh, environment and was, was known as what's a so-called maskil Torani, so, uh, which we might translate it as a sort of Torah secularist, or a sort of enlightened Torah scholar, right? And, and that was a legitimate position that one sort of in this institution sort of could develop. There were other Yiddish writers later who also had ties to the Volosian uh, Yeshiva. Yeah? Quick question. So this Yeshiva was not associated with the Hasidic no, this yeshiva was associated originally with the anti-Hasidic Orthodox okay. Jewish movement known as the Misnagdim, or the opponents, okay. so-called because they opposed Hasidism on the grounds of more traditional kind of uh, yeshiva orthodoxy. Okay. By this period, however, there had been a kind of rapprochement between these two movements, and there was no longer the same kind of bitter conflicts that we found throughout the 18th century, which, which really did shape the, the Hasidic movement in that period. By now, it was, uh, I mean, it's kind of hard to kind of imagine, right? I mean, there's a lot of memoirs about this, the Volodya Yeshiva, which kind of give you a better sense of what it was like. But, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't as draconian and kind of um, narrow as it might have seemed from the outside. It really did have quite a lot uh, of curiosity and, and diversity amongst the student body in terms of their intellectual interests. Um, and actually, it was in this environment, okay, in, after the, the failure of this, this first marriage, that Bernicevsky began writing. So he went from reading secular literature to writing. And he decided to write not only um, uh, not only short essays okay, about uh, Jewish life, but also um, religious texts. He wrote halachic commentaries on uh, portions of Jewish law. Okay? 
and he ended up publishing one of his first publications, shortly after this, uh, was a kind of anthology of Jewish religious texts. Okay, so he was already kind of operating as a kind of cultural critic in his early years, and also as someone who was interested in collecting and preserving Jewish religious history. Right, so he was not modernizing and sort of trying to break away directly from this tradition. And that's something that we find throughout his life. It's really better to think about his his relationship to traditional Judaism, not as a kind of gradual breaking away and becoming secular and becoming modern, but as a kind of constant back and forth, kind of a push and pull, which is really fraught with kind of inner conflicts. But those conflicts are also what fuel his energy and what actually give him kind of energy as a writer. Okay, so this is this is the period in the Galatian Yeshiva, and after that, he actually went to, um, to the West and he earned a PhD in German, no less, okay, which he taught himself. Okay, so within a period, within a very short time, he had really, via Odessa, he had made his way to, uh, to Breslau, Berlin, and Bern, and, and over six years, when he wrote almost nothing, he was just reading, and he was just immersing himself in German, uh, German thought. And this uh, dissertation was not, um, not an, a trivial topic. You see here the title. It is on the connection between ethics and aesthetics. Okay? So the question that he's asking in this dissertation is, what is the connection between morality and art? What is the link between what should be and what is? That is the, the basic German philosophical question in that he had immersed himself in. And this dissertation is full of engagements with Schopenhauer, Kant, and some post-Kantian idealists that I've never heard of before. And he is trying to kind of stake out a position among all of these figures and he's writing this very high philosophical register. On the other hand, and what I think is particularly interesting about it, I'll get to that in a second, is that when he comes up with his final conclusions here, right, in a certain sense, his conclusions are very Hasidic. Okay? And there's something deeply Hasidic about his entire approach to the question of how morality and art are supposed to be uh, related. Right? He says that the connection between morality and art is the individual will. Right? Um, everything that connects me to nature and to life, to heaven and to earth, to that which is human or superhuman, can affect me well or not so well. Um, can, it can be beautiful or not beautiful. Everything, without exception, according to its nature, but what really matters is that things um, are referred to my own personal interests and physical needs. That they are not judged from the standpoint of the general will, but rather um, that they stand to me in a superhuman, right? Ubermenschlich, überpersönlich. This is Nietzschean terminology, right? Nietzsche's idea of the superman, right? That which is beyond the self, which helps the self to confront reality, right? That they stand to me in this superhuman, objective relationship. Right? That is the relationship in which they have their effect on me. And then he continues down at the bottom. I must only leap over my tiny little organic world into freedom, into that which is open, which is clear. Right? Um, then I can truly and purely, objectively enjoy everything that is in the world and judge my own situation as, a, as an impartial judge or partisan. Okay. That's his conclusion. Again, a very Hasidic, almost mystical conclusion, a striving for transcendence, to go beyond the self, right, through the force of the will. And at the same time, it's, it's part of a reception of Nietzsche in Jewish philosophy in this period. This book, Nietzsche and Zion, gives you a good sense of how Jewish thinkers in this period you know, took Nietzsche's ideas and used them in reckoning with tradition and, and what it was to be a modern Jew. Okay, so following this phase, now we have the breakout phase of Berdyshevsky's career. Having discovered the will, it seems it wasn't hard for him to actualize that in the form of nine books, which he published in a single year, 1899 to 1900, and an important polemic with the well-known figure Achat Ha'am, who was a public intellectual um, uh, on modern Jewish identity, which they carried out from 1896 to 1902 in a number of periodicals. Okay. So this combination of these books, many of which were short stories in Hebrew, and which revolutionized kind of modern Hebrew uh, literary style by really turning this language into a vehicle for a kind of a very powerful uh, modern poetics.
and in many hands a kind of somewhat clunky and archaized kind of literary style. Um, in addition to that, it was this polemic with Achad Ha'am about what a modern Jew was that really turned Berchevsky into a big public figure. Um, and he became a kind of key figure in a, in a circle known as the, the, the Young Ones, it's Ayurim, um, which included Joseph Chaim Brenner and other, uh, other well-known writers. There's a new book, a new biography of, of Brenner by Anita Shapira that just came out in the Jewish Life series with Yale, which is a great book series. I definitely recommend you just check out a lot of those volumes. So that gives me another sense of kind of people he was engaged with. All right. And interestingly enough, as I said, Yerushevsky's relationship to his, to his roots was not just a linear kind of evolution and departure but much more of a kind of back and forth, or a push and pull. And so following this breakout phase in which he became famous public intellectual, and made a really compelling statement about modern Jewish identity, right? you would think that he would stay in the West right, and kind of sediment the, the, his reputation and continue publishing in, in German right, and, and other languages, and become a European right, figure. You know. But he didn't. Okay? Um, he, he actually went uh, went the other direction. So first of all, he stopped writing more or less uh, lots of work in German in this period. So he has only just a few stories in German. And his autobiography, he decided to write in German, okay, his third uh, language. Okay? Um, and that was never published. That he thought was going to be his great magnum opus, and it's still in the archive. Okay? Um, so other than that, okay, what he did was something very peculiar. He, he remarried. Right? So he actually this is third marriage, second marriage, we don't know what you know. It's very, very short. It's not, it's not go well. And I, I can tell that he was a difficult person. He's got a lot of depression issues, and, you know, mood swings and the like. Um, so, uh, but uh, the third marriage was amazing. I mean, it, it was really transformative for him, and it really uh, sort of sedimented the, the rest of his, his life and his work, which really ran together. Um, and it was at that point that he actually took up writing of all things in his mother tongue, in Yiddish. Okay. And that was connected to this, to this third marriage. I see a question. Two family questions. One, did he have a break with his father? Never. And I showed that to the rest of it. I know you that. And his third wife, was yes. she Jewish? Yes, she was. She was. She was a German, a German Jew, German-speaking Jew. And um, her name was Rachel Romberg. OK, and if you, um, if you were in um, uh, any household in the early 20th century probably would have seen or owned a copy of a book that they did together, known as Der Born Judas, the, the Well of Judah, which has been translated into Hebrew as Mimkor Israel, and actually has been translated into English as well, under the same title, Mimkor Israel. That is a kind of folklore anthology that they did together. She translated a lot of his Hebrew translations uh, into German for that. Um, not, they, so they were kind of together like the Brothers Grimm of Jewish folklore. In their, in their era. I and mean, this was the standard kind of folklore anthology alongside the Sefer HaAgadah of Bialik and Ravnitsky, and then later Louis Ginsburg's Legends of the Jews. Okay, so these three volumes together really are part of an important anthologizing tendency that occurred in Jewish literature in this period, in which Jews were trying to say, look, we have a kind of cultural heritage, okay? It's not just the Brothers Grimm, right? We have kind of folklore. We have these stories. We're going to collect them and arrange them and make them accessible to a broad public as part of kind of making a statement about what our national uh, identity is, right? So, so that was one of the things, one of the many things they did together. She was also kind of his muse, okay? So his last novel was kind of written not just for her, but with her, and he sort of dictated it on his deathbed to her, okay? And she was transforming his oral descriptions into text, and, and there's an interesting essay um, by Naamal Kem about this collaboration, no, sorry, by Amr Holtzman, actually, about this collaboration, okay, where she was kind of his muse, in a way. So it was not, just she wasn't, yeah, they were really part of um, in his work. And she was, she was a German, yeah, German student. So he didn't have a break with his father, okay, after all of this, he maintained connection with his father, they continued writing letters and such, and he wanted to introduce his new bride to his family, so he returned to his hometown, to Bova, in 1902. Um, and while he was there, he noted in his journal what a good feeling he had being, being back home, and especially of hearing Yiddish again, and listening to the people telling them their stories. And he began writing them down. So we know it was directly in connection with this hometown, this homecoming uh, visit, that he 
started to think about what it would be like to actually write in Yiddish for the first time. Which he did partly under the influence of Sholem Aleichem, with whom he greatly admired, and who was one of the only Yiddish writers of the period who actually thought his stuff was any good. A lot of them thought it was just too folksy. It was too down home, too hometown. Um, and, and it didn't have, didn't, didn't, wasn't dignified, right? It, it, looked, it made Jews look bad, right? In front of the Goyim, no less, right? There was a, there was a real anxiety, okay, about kind of uh, how this, this guy from the West all of a sudden decides to write in Yiddish, and people say, where have you been all this time, right? That's not how we talk, that's not how we are, you're making us look bad, right? The Shalom Leifen saw that there was something in this book, that what when it became these two books, that were that, that was really compelling. That was really capturing what they both thought of as a kind of folk spirit, the popular spirit um, of, of the So he ended up producing uh, from 1902 to 1906 176 uh, short items in Yiddish. And he was settled in, in Breslau in this period. And that was basically what he was working on. Uh, and there were various genres that he wrote. Some of them were rewritten folk tales. <clears throat> so tales that you might know from the Talmud, from the Midrash, right, the collections of Jewish law and more, um, that you would retell in Yiddish. Some of them were uh, one-act plays, okay, characters, sometimes just talking to each other on stage with very little context. Some of them were epistolary, not, not many, just a few. Um, and most of them took the form either of a kind of short story, kind of traditional short story, or of a monologue. So a lot of them are, like Shulman Lechem's work, Basically, a character is just sort of talking. And then the writer, Berchevsky, is listening to him. And you can sort of tell from the way the character talks what his relationship with the, with the writer is, right? You can tell that he sees him as kind of a weirdo, maybe an outsider. And the characters will often say, oh, you're back. Oh, it's so nice to see you. What have you been all this time? Let me tell you what's happened while you were gone. That's kind of the framework in which a lot of these stories kind of operate. And so this is a convenient literary device that Berchevsky uses in order to kind of project for the reader kind of vision of this small town, the small town life, and kind of give them a sense through the voices of these individual characters of all of the diversity that we find in this imaginary shell, in this imaginary town that he kind of creates, which is sort of modeled on his hometown, just like the writer is sort of modeled on him, but is also kind of diverse and, and is full of kind of inner conflicts and, and tension. So this is really what makes uh, him different from Shalom Aleichem, and what makes this book um, trans you know, sort of worth translating, I think, worth translatable, is that it gives you a really distinctive picture of, of the town and of the show. Whereas, you know, Tempe, the, the, the dairy man, you know, certainly has his problems. There's something just so lovable and warm and kind of almost idyllic about a lot of that world. And there's none of that in these stories. This is really the kind of gritty underbelly of the show. He really dwells quite a lot on uh, poverty. It's a major, major theme. And the consequences of poverty, both psychologically and practically on people's lives. Uh, forced migration and exile right, due to lack of employment opportunities and persecution. So many of these monologues are by migrants who are heading to South America or the United States. You clearly have no idea where they're going, or how far away things are, or what they expect them to get there. A lot of it uh, dwells upon issues of persecution, direct pogroms, as well as indirect persecution by uh, by Goyen in the marketplace for their settings. Okay? And, um, and then you have the psychological uh, picture of what it is to be um, uh, a young man or woman in society. You have a number of portraits of women struggling with gender roles and patriarchy, as well as portraits of men who are um, dealing with uh, edible complexes, patricidal complexes, okay? Really kind of Freudian uh, stuff, right? So, so that is really um, what this imaginary shell um, uh, kind of presents to us. And at the same time, there is a lot of hope and there is a kind of uh, humor, albeit sort of a dark humor, in a lot of the um, stories. So, so, why am, I, um, why am I telling you all this? Okay. Why is this relevant to learning and teaching about the Shoah? Well, as I said uh, you know, in the conversation, I hope I'll get to hear more from you why it might be relevant, or why you might see continuities um, between what you are teaching and learning here and uh, this kind of period in uh, history and your chest experience. But I want to kind of continue by highlighting two particular areas that these stories return to 
uh, time and again, in which we, start, we see a certain kind of uh, very significant reflection on the, the pressures on, on traditional Jewish life, and the, not the direct historical roots of the Shoah, at least the kind of broader cultural and spiritual roots of some of the issues that we would discover um, you know, 30 years later. Okay? So the first of them is actual pogroms. Obviously, you know, it's not as if, uh, as we all know, it's uh, you know, uh, some systematic genocide just sprang up overnight. Right? You had a long history of pogroms. Um, before that, and that's one of the one of the topics of a number of these stories. So what I wanted to do, first of all, was to present to you this one uh, this one example, that probably the clearest uh, example in the entire book, where Berdachevsky takes a town's experience in Islam and turns it into a Yiddish story. Um, an interesting thing that we can observe here is what is the nature of the transformations okay, that he as a writer, enacts upon this historical event, upon the material that's available to him. And what kind of statement is he possibly making about the significance of this event um, as he kind of rewrites or changes certain details right, in order to turn it into so, so the pogrom in question, um, uh, which was in the town of Orsha, okay, um, or Usha as it's sometimes written, um, uh, was reported on in this Russian Jewish uh, monthly magazine. And we know that he was inspired by this news report. He took a note of it in his journal. Okay? Um, so this is a quote from the, the newspaper's report. As the fallen members of the Jewish self-defense militia were being laid to rest in the town of Orsha, right, because during the pogrom, the local Jews Young Jewish men had formed a band of self-defense militia, right? And they had all been killed. And so at the funeral, afterwards, right, a humble Jewish woman from Shklov approached the grave and spoke. Fourteen years I prayed to the Lord for a child. And he gave me a son, my only son. He was 17 years old. When we heard that the Jews of Orsha had been attacked, my son was eager to go to the aid of his brothers there. I did not hold him back, and I told him, Go, my son, for the blood of your brother has been spilled. He met his death. Yet, I will not weep for him. With that, she collapsed. Okay. So that is the newspaper report. Now, there are a couple of versions of the newspaper report. There is the Russian version. There is also a German version okay, of the report, which emphasizes here this line, uh, my only son. And she says, he was my son, my only son. This is actually an allusion to Genesis, to the binding of Isaac. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, etc. Right? Now, the, the boy's name was, in fact, Abraham. And so in the German version, they emphasize some parallel here between Abraham, the sacrifice of Isaac, and this woman's loss or sacrifice of her only son. Okay? So already what I want to emphasize here is that in the newspapers, right, this eulogy, which we can't recover directly, we can only recover it through these rewritings, right, is being kind of turned into a literary form in itself, right? There's a kind of allegory here being drawn through scripture to the sacrifice of the beloved son, right? An important Christian theme as well, as we know. Right? So, um, Berdyshevsky takes this short newspaper notice and he writes an entire um, story around it, okay, which is short enough that I think, with your permission, I will read it out loud. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes? Is there a biblical reference also to go my son where the blood of your blood has been spilled? Yes, and that is the one that he picks up on in his version of the story. So he takes that yeah. and yeah. suppresses... Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so you're anticipating one of my points here, which is that no, no, this is great. This is, this is, this is great. So, it, so right. So, so that that illusion, right, is the one that you'll see and listen for it. Get, you know, you get, get you know extra credit. You know, <laughs> so, uh, when he alludes to that, because he's going to suppress entirely the whole the whole time of Isaac mm -hmm. side of things, and he's going to play up the King Abel side, which then makes us as the audience start to think, well, what kind of type of story is this, right? Like, who's King? Who's Abel? Right, and how do we, the readership, sort of fit into that? Right, so it creates a kind of different dynamic. That's 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 really interesting. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, so the story in question is called Hova, or uh, the eulogy. In the Torah, oh, sorry, I should, before I start there, I should say, there's a subtitle also, and the subtitle is the page from the history books. Okay, from the Shifra. Okay, so that's another example where in the other stories you're very explicit about the fact that this is a story that's drawn from, from life. Okay. In the Torah, there's a law that a groom is exempt from going to war. Someone who's just gotten engaged or built a house or planted a new vineyard, he has to stay home so he can enjoy them with his wife. So he can warm the house and watch the first buds bloom. That's why he's exempt from the service. That's why they can't have him for a soldier. Praise the Lord that we haven't always observed such customs or followed the law too strictly. On the contrary, we've heard stories in which the bride herself pushes her beloved groom into battle, where new homeowners tear down their houses so they can impale the enemy on the beams. For mothers send their only sons into battle, wearing shirts sewn with their own hands. And such things have been known to happen not only in the distant past, but also much more recently. In a village, close to a large town in Bolin, lived a Jewish woman by the name of Boab. She had lived in the village her whole life. From her father, who settled there back in the days when Jews could still buy land, she inherited a house with a garden and a small field. Bola knew how to till the soil and work the field. While she had not inherited much, it brought her a livelihood, and she would contribute to those in need. She didn't rely on too many laborers, as her son Beryl helped her with everything. Beryl was a country boy, just like in the Bible. Strapping lab with an eager face and a pair of strong hands that could do anything and wouldn't rest for a minute. He was a joy to behold, even if he was rather less skilled with his letters than you and me, dear readers. Boa was truly proud of her son. Now, Boa was not one of those people who are afraid to go out by themselves at night. Still, she relied on Beryl for such things. Like they say, everything has its place. If you don't have a husband, relatives nearby, a sister or a brother, and you're raising the only Jewish child in the village, even if Vasily and Ivan and the other Goyim had always been friendly with her, then it's right stopping by for a nice glass of spirits. Even then, you have to remember, you're in exile. You can say Kiddush. You can bake Chal. You can have a whole Seder if you like. But when it's harvest time and there's work to be done in the fields, that's when Beryl really comes in handy. <coughs> People with a masculine physique were created that way for a reason. Lola and her son Beryl were very close. Beryl looked a lot like his father, who died young. A horse hurled him straight down and broke his neck. In summer, there was a lot to do, as I said. There was no time for anything other than work. But in the long winter nights, in the bright, warm house with a blizzard outside, Bola would sit by the fire, knitting stockings, while Beryl chopped wood, completely absorbed in his task, and at such moments she looked at him so full of joy that it made her eyes bring with tears. Then dark times fell upon the province where Bola lived. Another dreadful war. Imagine, a land where you can't be certain that your very life is secure, where people say, they've taken what's mine, was theirs is mine. The land where you can be attacked in broad daylight, where everyone wants to be on top, where everyone wants to turn the whole world upside down. So people stop working, the mills stand idle, granaries go up in flames. Truly, as they say, one man swallows another alive. Not that it compares to the suffering of the Jews. The vicious hatred like never before had broken out against them. Imagine, in broad daylight, Rioters, rioters swarmed into hundreds of Jewish towns, looted everything they had, and murdered hundreds of people in cold blood. That's right. Let it loose, and murderous rage knows no bounds. Children were stabbed before their mother's eyes like in the days of Gonta the Cossack. 
They tore the flesh right off the living frames. They inflicted every depravity in the world upon the Jewish body. Truly, the full weight of God's chastisement had fallen upon the Jews. Nope. Nope. I'm not writing a second book of Lamentations. We need a second scepter of Judah for that matter. I'd rather tell you about the Jews who rose up during those extreme times, who began to reject the whole notion of chastisement and of taking God's punishment upon oneself. I'd rather tell you about the young people who, where it was written, and they shall flee as fleeing from the sword, where it says Jews should run away from the enemy and let themselves be killed, turned back and said, no, we won't run. I'd rather tell you about the young people who truly tried to take a stand against the enemy, the same young people who'd been afraid to enlist in the army, when they bought rifles, taught themselves to shoot. And when people came to shoot them, they said, they shot right back. What does the verse say? If one has come to kill you, rise early to kill him. If someone has come to kill you, you may kill him as well. In the town near the village where Boba lived, in the little towns all around, one heard of horrible programs against Jews. It was happening every month in those days, and every town was the same. Yet, they felt an even greater fear of what was soon to come. It's human nature. In the town not far from Boaz's village, they had already been talking about the Day of Judgment for a week, and they braced themselves for its arrival. Some had run away to other towns but never made it, because things were even worse there. Most had stayed behind, and some said, we shall resist. Courageous young people couldn't run away when their mothers would be murdered and their sisters put to shame. They girded their loins with swords and said, like Simeon and Levi, what? Should you deal with our sister as with a harlot? It was a winter's day. A freezing wind cut through the village, flowing together with the sighs of the battered people being beaten further down. The Goyen were prepared to head into town to watch when the time came to take part. Local peasants, good friends of Goa, were playing down like they'd never laid eyes on her, and it wouldn't take much for them to storm her house. They were just waiting for someone to come and give the signal. But Gola wasn't thinking of herself. As soon as she saw that the horrors would not cease, she called her son and she said to him, Go. Go to your people and help. She helped him clean the rifle herself. She took out the leather, leather pouch full of bullets and prepared everything for his journey. She told him not to take the main road. Half an hour later, when she saw her son all suited up and ready to go, Joy flashed on her face like lightning. And with a bold heart, Beryl went. He walked into town into the midst of the flames. He threw himself on the enemy with all his strength, helping his friends from the self-defense league who had already grown weary and thin in number. They said Beryl did incredible things, annihilated a great number of enemies, saved many people's lives. For three hours he fought with the strength of ten men, wondrous and wild. Then along came a little boy brat, Shakits, picked up a sharp rock, aimed it at Beryl, hit him, and cracked open his head. And so the Goliath of the Jews was felled by the little David of those tramps. After they had been... And so the Goliath of the Jews was felled by the little David of those tramps. After they had looted the city and murdered all those people, the military arrived to extinguish the flames that had already burned themselves out. Then the Jews began to bury their dead, bring them to their resting place. An encampment of people trailed behind the funeral procession. They carried 13 litters. They did not bang with the poor boxes or shout, Righteousness delivereth from death. Yet who can describe the terrifying cries that were heard on that? Mothers weeping over their murdered children, children wailing and mourning their dead mothers and fathers. Rivers of tears ran from the Jews, men and women alike. The whole society carried its fallen victims to the grave, even as many were still overcome by terror in their hearts. Silently, in a long black dress, head shrouded by a dark veil, Boa walked behind the procession. She walked upright, not bowed. No one even knew who she was in such a moment. Who would think of casting glances at a stranger? The crowd reached the graveyard. They stopped at the tent, the mausoleum. Heart-wrenching prayers began to fill the air. God, full of mercy. Jews struck their hands together and cried to heaven. And they began to bury the fallen, some people in the crowd collapsed. You might say that was how they performed the ceiling of the graves. And everyone felt certain that the 
gates of mercy, a song shot. The 13th grade was Beryl's. Beryl, the finest young man of his village, who had came to help and receive death as his reward. And as they began to cover him over with earth, the veiled woman in the shroud stepped forward, lifted her voice, and spoke. I am the mother of the slain, he whom you are now laying to rest. I sent him to you. I shall not cry and say, God has taken my son from me. No one took him. I offered him my own accord. My heart told me that he would not return alive. And still I sent him to you, that he might be among you, that he might die for you. Okay. So uh, I think I'll pause here. <laughs> and um, I'd love to hear from you. I mean, it's, um, the two areas in which I think we find some very interesting and profound spiritual continuities between the world of southern Ukraine at the turn of the century and the world that we discover again 25, 30, 35 years later. Two areas are, first, this very complex history of Rome's persecution side by side with being neighbors, right, with feeling temporarily safe, and how this story captures that dynamic and gives the characters a sort of kind of, in Jaroszewski's terms, will to overcome that idea. I think it's very interesting. I'd like to hear what you think about that. The second area, which we can talk about if we have more time, is specifically in relation to Christianity, we find in these towns, in this world, in these stories, and how that plays in as well to this, to this spiritual situation. But first, let me, let me just elicit any reactions. If you want to take a minute, take, take the time, you know, um, questions, these points you wanted to draw out from the story where it gets us to. My father was born in 1905 in a little shtetl outside of Odessa called Ananya, which was on the edge of a Cossack training camp. He would not talk about it. I was always interested in history, and no matter what I asked him, he wouldn't say anything. They hated us. That's all you have to know until I took him to see Denver on the roof. At which point, especially with the chanik on the table, because his mother had one just like it, he said, he suddenly opened up and all of these details I knew nothing about came pouring forth. And I think it is sometimes very difficult, especially for those of us with the good fortune to be raised in this country to realize what our ancestors went through in those years. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why we have to tell stories. You know? Exactly. And retell and translate and listen to stories because it's through those stories that those moments become possible again that are closed for a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I love that story. I mean, I don't know Bert Chesky, but I know that we would read more. And I especially liked the quasi-objective view that he takes and speak, says everything very bluntly, but you feel the pain that he alludes to in just one ironic uh, word usage. So, I would really like to ask you what's the name of that story. Devora, uh, or the eulogy, uh, is, the, is the title that I've given. I mean, that, that's the translation. It, it's uh, basically the same in Yiddish. Yeah. Devora yeah. has been. In his writing, did he say that the mother collapsed? So, um, no, right? That's another example of how he changed what he inherited from the newspaper. She absolutely did not collapse. She's standing upright, right. walking by the procession. Right. Great. Absolutely, yeah. So could you tell from his story whether he thought the mother was good or silly or whether she did? What did, what did you guys think about his attitude towards the character or about the attitude that he wanted the audience to? I mean, I would be a big issue as well. Mm-hmm. He's just one of the better. Hey, The patriot of the Muslim play, she sort of said that the better brother, brothers who were the blood brothers. Right. Well, something that, you know, um, uh, 
we find that, for instance, this figure of the so-called Dorpsia, or country Jew, which I think is very interesting, and it comes up a lot in the Jewish literature. This idea that there's Jews who live in Jewish towns, okay, and then there's Jews who don't. There's Jews on the periphery, like this character, who are only surrounded by Bosnia and Ivan and the other Goyim, right? And that's the world. And so the interesting thing about this character is that when Bush comes to Shah, she sends her son. It's not his town that he's defending. She didn't have to do that, right? And so there's kind of a very strong not just the sacrifice, but on kind of the continuity between Jews that that cause of that sacrifice to be particularly meaningful. There's another story which we probably want to discuss with you guys about guy who sacrifices all of his savings to save a Jewish girl who's converted to Christianity and is going to be a so-called captive among the Goyim and be lost to Judaism, not even killed, right, but just no longer a Jew. And even then, he, this Dorsier kind of gives up everything. So, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Did he, in his writing, allude to others who maybe had observed and let this happen? We call them bystanders, and that's one of the main things we sort of uh, provide a lot of information during our tours is that why did people stand by their neighbors allowing this to happen? Can you that? So it's interesting, right, because I'm sure that there are a lot of you know Jewish bystanding phenomena as well, but he, in his stories it's never like that. It's always about the heroic Jew that saves the town or you know, the sacrifice or the entire community. And um, what we find in this story I just read are very clear ideas about bystanding on the part of the non-Jewish community, right? The, the army that comes after everything's done burning, right? The 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 point where good friends until they're just waiting for opportunities to fund the house, right? And so that's partly an interesting dynamic that that bystanding has to do with, of course, they aren't true. How can you be sort of neighbors and murderers? Right? What is that like? You know, what does that mean? Uh, first of all, I just um, and your statement at the beginning about that his work is a lot darker than uh, Shalom Aleichem. Uh, that's the understatement of the year. <laughs> I came today because uh, the topic uh, uh, passed Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, last Thursday night, I had the pleasure of, the art of seeing Fiddler on the Roof, the Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish, uh, which I must say was a very interesting production, very warm, but very disappointing to me because I grew up in a household where Yiddish was the language used by your parents when they didn't want you to hear what they were saying. And I thought I'd understand a lot. About 10% was all I got. I had to go to the translation of all of it. But it's the, the nuance here that's really interesting to me is that, speaking of the mother, that context is the most important aspect of this all. Because when you said go forth and et cetera, I, I couldn't help thinking of the, the, uh, the Islamic woman today who says go forth and become a martyr for your cause. But, you know, to determine who is the aggressor and who is defending it and the context, the nuance, is right. Right. the real right. The real criteria. Right, so Berenczewski's dissertation, you know, which is about morality and art, really gets at this issue because in a certain sense from his standpoint, right, we're not really in a position to judge that mother of the suicide bomber either, right? Because because there's no objective standpoint. That, that that's not how he looks at it, right? He's interested in the spiritual dimension, and that can cause major problems, right? Because of course you want to be able to judge to and to assign moral criteria to these actions, but it, it, gets, it all gets very blurry when you're in the domain of a kind of almost like a transcendental will, right? I mean, that, that you know, Nietzsche was influential on fascism too, right? So it's a very messy, messy, messy situation. We live in a world today that's looking for the easiest, you know, everything's a panacea. We can come mm -hmm. up with a solution to every problem that's easy to understand, everybody should accept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me too, he, he created that muddiness and ambiguity by calling the small stone thrower game against the Goliath, who was this heroic, self-sacrificing man. Right. Not the Goliath that we know, you know, from our text. So mm -hmm. I think he's he's asking us to see it in all these ways. Right. I mean, he, he says, you know, go where the blood of your brother has been spilled, right? So as you point out, he picks up on the Cain and Abel reference, but not the, you know, Isaac and Abraham reference. And so, 
there, by using the biblical illusion, he really creates the sense of spiritual connection between Jews. But he also has this ironic kind of illusion to David and Goliath, and to the point where you're saying, well, what is he, how can we trust scripture, right? Is that a valid proof text? Well, if one is valid, why isn't the other valid, right? And so, Lechel and Lechem and Tevye, right? Every time you find a quotation in Shon Lechem, it's wrong. There's something very off about it. But Tevye is a brilliant, he's an erudite, non BS artist, right? I mean, he really, he's never, the quotations are never quotations. There's always a change that happens. And so you have to be, and I, mean, I didn't even want to pause my reading to give you all the footnotes, but the volume has footnotes, which will tell you this is an allusion to the Mishnah, this is an allusion to the Bible, this is an allusion to this. But those allusions are never really just sort of using the text, they're also changing and subverting. That's because he doesn't know how to read. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably learned all this oral tradition. But there's a little subtlety here, which I don't know was intentional or typo. But the original, uh -huh. the secular report, yeah. is closer to the biblical quotation uh -huh. than the Christian. For sure. Because he uses the singular for brother. Is good, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. That's interesting, actually. Um, that's, that's, that's interesting, yeah. No, I don't, I don't think it's a typo. I don't think it's a typo. No, well, but I, mean, I don't know because this is coming from, this is coming from Russian through Yiddish, so, you know. Let's yeah take it with a grain of salt because you know because I'm translating that from yeah so but uh, uh, but these are you know this whoever this journalist is they also have those references available to them right so it's it's always legitimate to ask how are writers you know growing a common pool of allegories right or images and again another question to throw back at you is sort of you know how do you know in Shoah when people tell their stories both during and after you know how do these biblical allegories function for them right are they kind of do they take things? Do they assign meaning to the experience? Do they, do they elevate the experience? Are they ironic? Right? They, you know, how, how does this kind of literary tradition that's, that's shared by everyone, right, um, change its, its meaning for people as as they use it to retell their, their stories? Let's see if we have two hands. Up. So we'll first go to the back. Okay. Uh, I picked up a couple of things in the story that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, considering that nationalism was was forming and advancing during this period of time. We hear the mother, we hear the author of the story speaking of how you can be friends with your neighbors, but you're never really part of them. You're always really separate. And the idea later on that the police or the military, whatever, arrives to help, but the flames have already gone out. So they, they're really not helping at all. The other idea of um, <coughs> the son having been trained in defense, mm -hmm. knowing how to shoot a gun, which isn't something that we normally think of Jews doing, especially at their time, um, brings to mind, you know, uh, Jabotinsky, a uh -huh. later a Zionist who goes into Eastern Europe and does just that, forms, you know, youth groups and trains the kids how to use guns. <coughs> My question is, was this man a Zionist? Was he influenced by Zionism? Because it sounds like he was. That's, that's a great question. And I mean, um, in this particular case, as far as the character is concerned, I don't know. I don't know what we can know about him that's, that's not you know, in the newspaper or in the story, because we don't have a lot of other evidence. But I guess, um, as I said before, one of the things that I think is very useful about the Dushevsky is importance for us. Right? Is, that, is that he has a, a different Zionism, right? He has a different vision of Zionism. And it's, it's a Zionism that is just as much kind of about the you know, uh, tradition of you know, lore and midrash and Jewish storytelling as it is about kind of territorial you know, um, acquisition and kind of military prowess, right? Like, for him, those things are sort of all connected at the register of the will of the spirit and the way that he thinks through and how they, they shoot it together, putting in a different, very different corner from John Tinsley, certainly, right, certainly, but also from contemporary spiritual Zionists like Chava Am and his character. So, so it's interesting, because it's important because it helps us to recover a different way of thinking about the meaning of Zionism before there was, you know, Zionism like we come to know after the war, which is a totally different phenomenon, totally different movement. Yeah, so I see one, two, I saw two, yeah. Uh, I want to take what Barb said and, uh, make it even a little more current, and uh, if this doesn't make sense, please say so. But I was moved by the difference between the 
the, the biblical rules about you can't fight because mm -hmm. this, 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 and this, and then the fact that in this case, and I'm going to use Israel as an example, pre-state Israel, the concept in general, which is an unfair generalization, uh, Jewish people were victimized, quote unquote, with a lot of different exceptions. But post-Israel, the vision of the Zionist hero mm -hmm. who takes the gun, defends mm -hmm. the land, and changes the whole concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he says in the story, right, sort of, Jews can't forget that they're in exile. And that changes a lot of these laws in Deuteronomy, which let's not forget, in their original context, are about a nation state in the land, right? So part of the statement, I think, in the story, and you helped me to kind of to realize this, is that, you know, he's saying, yeah, yeah, maybe those things apply, but they apply when you actually have a nation state that's in the land. And if you're in exile, then let's tell a different story about what our situation is, right? So he's, you know, he's, his Talmudic education means that there's always a context, there's always a literary context underlying his statements, right? He might not, but, he, but it also means that he's rarely going to tell you what that context is. Right? So it's, you, it's your job as an audience member, as a reader, to kind of understand how his statements fit together or contradict one another, given the fact that they refer to different contexts, right? <laughs> Sorry, I saw your hand earlier. Oh, yeah, well, um, struck me was like the very last couple of lines when he says, you know, I will not be forgiven in my ascension so that you may live because that's like the psionic mm -hmm. Totally. Yes, totally. I would, that's if we have more time, I would love to talk about how Bichesky writes about Jesus, okay? How he writes about <laughs> Christianity, okay? Because they use this yet. But I'm worried we're running out of time. Dan, how are we doing on Can I start wrapping things up? Five minutes? Five minutes? Okay. Yes. In what language were his stories published? They were published in written and published in this collection. The majority of his work, which is better known, is written in Hebrew, published in Hebrew. And you can find good translations of some of that into English. There's a volume called Miriam and Other Stories, translated into English, which is widely accessible. When you use a translator, in this area of learning English, what am I going to do? Do you ever get stuck in the side and say, which way am I going to go? Sure. It's very completely different than the how you Right. And how do you handle that? So, right. Uh, well, I mean, that's a fundamental um, issue in, in you know, translation. Um, and uh, I think, again, it's important to bear in mind the literary context right, that you as a translator are inhabiting. For the, for the period of time that you're engaged with that particular work, right? And in this particular work, as a translator, there are competing demands, right? On the one hand, there is the demand of the uh, oral context, right? So these characters are written in an oral way, so they don't talk super coherently, right? In fact, they say um and you know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, the hardest words to translate are little words like odds, the jim, okay, uh, which, are, which are all important for understanding their speech. The most difficult word in the whole book to translate is yid, okay? What is a yid? A yid is a Jew, as opposed to a boy. A yid is a human being, as opposed to a non-human, as opposed to a lesser human, right? A yid is a mensch, that's what it's not exactly, necessarily. A yid is sometimes just a man. Sometimes both men and women, right? So that gives you a great example of kind of how you have to put yourself in the shoes of kind of the speaker as best you can and understand your context. On the other hand, you know, you're responsible to your audience. And so, you know, you don't want to oversimplify things or distort things just in order to make to make sense of them for the English audience. So this particular volume like that's been my, my great challenge is to kind of preserve the, the verbal texture of this book. Yeah. Uh, to build on that, I'm just curious how much you know about your own family's history. Um, Dan uh, introduced you with uh, uh, some very impressive academic uh, work that you've done, but what drew you to this subject, and is there a personal connection with family? Yeah, you know, thank you. you know, and I mean, this is another thing that, thank you, you know, when you were saying earlier, you know, that, that we, um, 
you know, the chiming, that was what really got me. Uh, I, you know, it's a hot in the chiming to have that conversation, right? <laughs> we realized we could grab a kettle. Uh, right, um, like what we're doing and in telling these stories, I mean, you know, we're standing here in St. Louis in 2019 and we're having this conversation about these years' stories that were written, you know, they all died almost exactly 100 years ago, and, um, you know, my grandparents came from Ukraine in the, you know, turn of the 19th century, you know, from, from Odessa and, uh, you know, and Belarus as well, and they were not the Yiddish was their, you know, language, and my grandfather had to learn it, you know, because, you know, he was, you know, assimilating, right, as quickly as he possibly could. Uh, and, and at the same time, it's through these stories that you, know, you find, you know, that kind of coming full circle and, and actually wanting to understand what that world is like, right? And, and partly, it can't be done without the language, right? I mean, y Yiddish was the language in which people dreamt and fought and had these problems. That's why, again, Fiddler on the Roof only takes us so far, right? Because we need to think about Yiddish as a language in which all of these Sometimes terrible things happen, right? And so you need you need the language, but it's also this new translation movement um, that's happening that, that takes it beyond kind of that original context and restores it to our context. And so you know, Yiddish literature, thanks to Yiddish Book Center, thanks to the General Finger Web, which is published in English, I really recommend it. It's free online, subscribe to it. Um, they're you know, doing constantly new translations, articles, performances, discussions. I have friends my age, I went to grade school with, who are writing original poems in Yiddish, and they born them as adults, right? I learned Yiddish as an adult in Germany, actually, originally, and then through Hebrew and you know, education here. So, I mean, this is a this is a, a big cultural revival that is actually happening now, and I think it's happening partly because there are authors like this, and there are communities like this, where people people have that capacity to really, to really bring it full circle. There's nothing, there's nothing necessary about that, didn't you? You know, it didn't come down directly to me through through some you know kitchen dish or something, right? So that, you know, I came to and had to kind of rediscover on my own, and that's part of what makes it so compelling. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you'd be happy to stay after if anyone wants.